This is the video for section 7.3, subgroups. The subgroups of a group are often useful for analyzing the structure of a group. So our definition says that a subset H of a group G is a subgroup of G, provided that H is itself a group under the operation in G. Now every group G has two subgroups, G itself, and the set consisting of only the identity element, E, which is called the trivial subgroup. All other subgroups are called proper subgroups. For our first example, the set of integers, Z, is a group under ordinary integer addition. And we want to show that the set of even integers, E, is a subgroup of Z. To show this, we can show that E satisfies the four group axioms. So first, G1 is closure for all A, B, and E. A plus B is in E. And the sum of two even integers is an even integer. So that tells us that E satisfies axiom G1. Next is G2, the associative law, for all elements A, B, and C in E. A plus the quantity B plus C is equal to the quantity A plus B plus C. Now the associative law of addition holds for all integers in Z, so certainly holds for the even integers. Therefore, E satisfies G2. Next, G3, the existence of an identity element. So this says that there exists an element E in the set E, such that for all elements A and E, A plus E is equal to A, and E plus A is equal to A. Well, the identity element in Z is zero, which is even, so belongs to E, and the two equalities hold for all integers in Z, so hold for all even hold for all even integers in E. Therefore, E satisfies G3. Next, G4, existence of inverse elements. For each A and E, there exists an element minus A and E, such that A plus minus A is equal to E, and minus A plus A is equal to E. If we suppose A is an arbitrary even integer, then minus A is also even, so belongs to E, and the two equalities hold, so E satisfies G4. Therefore, E satisfies the four group axioms, so is a subgroup of Z. Now we saw in this example that in order to show E is a subgroup of Z, we were able to omit verifying axiom G2, the associative law, along with the equalities in axioms G3 and G4. In general, if we suppose that H is a non-empty subset of a group G, since the associative law holds for all elements of G, it must then hold for all elements of H. This means we can omit verifying G2, the associative law, when showing that H is a subgroup. And as in the example, we can also omit verifying the equalities in G3 and G4. In fact, we can also omit verifying G3 altogether, as shown in the following theorem. This is theorem 7.11. A subset H of a group G is a subgroup of G if and only if it satisfies three conditions. SG0, non-empty, which says that H is non-empty. SG1, closure, for all A, B in H, A times B is in H and SG2, containment of inverses. For all elements A and H, the inverse, A inverse, belongs to H. To prove this, we've got a biconditional, and the forward direction follows immediately from the definition of a subgroup. A subgroup satisfies the four group axioms, so will satisfy the three conditions in the theorem, SG0, SG1, and SG2. To prove the backward direction, We'll suppose that H is an arbitrary subset of G. Suppose H satisfies the three conditions, SG0, SG1, and SG2. We need to show that H is a subgroup of G. And to show this, we need to show that H satisfies the four group axioms. So we'll start with G1, closure, for all elements A, B, and H, A times B is an H. And G1 is identical to SG1. And since we're supposing that H satisfies SG1, then H must satisfy G1. 
G2 is the associative law for all A, B, C, and H. A times the quantity B, C is equal to the quantity A, B times C. And as discussed above, since the associative law holds for all elements of G, then it must hold for all elements of H. So H satisfies G2. G3, the existence of an identity element. There exists an element E in H such that for all A and H, A times E is equal to A and E times A is equal to A. Well, first note that since H is not empty, then there exists an element A in H. Then by SG2, containment of inverses, A inverse belongs to H. And by SG1, closure, A times A inverse, which is the identity element E, belongs to H. So therefore, H contains the group identity element. And since the identity element E satisfies the two conditions, A times E is equal to A, and E times A is equal to A, for all A and G, then it must satisfy these conditions for all A and H. Therefore, H satisfies G3. And G4, existence of inverse elements, says for each A and H, there exists an element A inverse in H, such that A times A inverse is equal to the identity and A inverse times A is equal to the identity. So suppose A is an arbitrary element of H. By SG2, A inverse belongs to H. And since A inverse is the inverse to A and G, then A times A inverse is equal to E, and A inverse times A is equal to E. So therefore, H satisfies G4. And thus, H is a subgroup of G. And this proves the backward direction, so completes the proof of the theorem. For an example, let's let H be the following subset of GL2R. GL2R, remember, is the general linear group of 2 by 2 matrices with real entries. So these are 2 by 2 real entry entry matrices with a non-zero determinant under the operation of matrix multiplication. So our subset is going to be uh, the set of matrices of the form 1B01, where B is a real number. So these are 2 by 2 matrices with ones on the main diagonal and uh, a real number entry B in the upper right corner and a zero in the lower left corner. And you can see that the determinant of these matrices will be 1, which is not 0, which tells us that these matrices are non-singular or invertible. Well, we want to show that H is a subgroup of GL2R. And using theorem 711, to show that H is a subgroup, we can verify the three conditions in the theorem, SG0, SG1, and SG2. Well, first, H is clearly non-empty, so satisfies SG0. So moving on to SG1, closure, we need to show for all A, B, and H, A times B is in H. So suppose A equal the matrix 1A01 and B the matrix 1B01 are arbitrary elements of H. Then the product AB is equal to the product of these two matrices. And this is going to be the matrix with uh, ones on the main diagonal and an A plus B in the upper right corner. Now, since this has the form of elements of H, namely ones on the diagonal, zero in the lower left corner, and a real number in the upper right hand corner, then the product AB belongs to H. And therefore, H satisfies SG1. Next, SG2, containment of inverses. So we want to show for all A and H, A inverse belongs to H. So if we suppose that A equal the matrix 1A01 is an arbitrary element of H, then A inverse will be the matrix with uh, ones on the main diagonal and a minus A in the upper right hand corner. And this has the form of elements of H, so therefore A inverse belongs to H, and therefore H satisfies SG2. And thus H is a subgroup of the group GL2R. The next theorem shows that for a finite subset H, we only need to verify H is non-empty and closure to show H is a subgroup, so we can cut down our work still further. This is theorem 7.12, and let H be a non-empty finite subset of a group G, 
if H is closed under the operation in G, then H is a subgroup of G. So we just have to verify that it's non-empty and it's closed. We don't have to verify that it contains inverses. For the proof, well, let's suppose that H is closed under the operation in G. We need to show that H is a subgroup of G. And since we're supposing that H is non-empty and closed by theorem 711, it remains only to show that H satisfies SG2. So let's suppose that A is an arbitrary element of H. We need to show that its inverse, A inverse, belongs to H. In the case that A is equal to the identity element, then A inverse is equal to the identity element also, and the con conclusion holds. So let's suppose then A is not equal to the identity element. Since H is closed, then for each positive integer k, A to the k power will belong to H. And since H is finite, then these powers cannot all be distinct. It then follows from theorem 7.8 in the previous section that A has finite order. So let's suppose that A has order n. Since A is not equal to the identity, then the order n must be greater than 1. And by theorem 7.9 part 2, since n minus 1 is congruent to minus 1 mod n, then a to the n minus 1 power will be equal to a to the minus 1 power. Since n is greater than 1, then n minus 1 is greater than 0. So a to the negative 1 is equal to a to the n minus 1 belongs to h. And therefore, H satisfies SG2, so H is a subgroup. And this completes the proof of the theorem. For an example of how we can apply this theorem, we can show that the subset H shown, so R0, R1, and R2, is a subgroup of S3. So these are three permutations of the elements 1, 2, and 3. Now note that R0 is the identity permutation. It maps 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3. Now since H is a finite subset, theorem 712 tells us that it suffices to show that H is closed under the group operation, which is composition. So to show this, we can show all possible compositions of two elements from H belong to H. Now since R0 is the identity element, then R0 composed with R0 is just R0. R0 composed with R1 is equal to R1 composed with R0 is equal to R1. R2 composed with R0 is equal to R0 composed with R2, which is equal to R2. And these all belong to H. So the other compositions are, well, R1, R1, this will be the permutation 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 1 composed with itself. And computing this composition, we obtain the permutation 1 maps to 3, 2 to 1, and 3 to 2, and this is R2. Then R1 composed with R2, that will be this composition, and this turns out to be the permutation 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3, which is our identity, R0. And R2 composed with R1 turns out to be the same, the identity permutation R0. And finally, R2 composed with itself is this composition. And this turns out to be the permutation 1 maps to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 1, which is R1. So all possible compositions belong to H, which shows that H is closed. And thus, H is a subgroup. We're going to define a special subgroup. So let's suppose G is a group then the center of G is the subset Z of G consisting of all elements A and G that satisfy the condition for all G and G, AG is equal to GA. So an element A and G belongs to the center if and only if A commutes with every element of G. For a couple examples, Let's consider the symmetric group S3 on three symbols. So this is the set of 
six permutations on the elements 1, 2, and 3. And it can be shown that the only element that commutes with every element is the identity, which means that the center consists of just the identity. As another example, in an abelian group G, every element commutes with every other element. So that tells us that the center will be the entire group G. So these are the two extremes, where in one case the center is just the identity subgroup, and in the other case the center is the entire group. And for most groups, the center is somewhere in between. So for an example, the operation table for the dihedral group D4 is shown, and the dihedral group, remember, this is the group of symmetries of the square, so there are eight symmetries of the square, the identity along with three rotations, and then four reflections. And we want to find the center. So we need to find the elements of D4 that commute with every other element. Now certainly the identity element R0 commutes with all other elements, so it belongs to the center. And an element will commute with all other elements if and only if the element's row is the same as the element's column. So examining the rows and columns in the operation table, we can see that the only other element besides the identity that satisfies this condition is R2. So if you look at the row for R2, <clears throat> it matches the column for R2. And Therefore, the center, which is Z of D4, consists of the set containing R0 and R2. So R2 is the only other element besides the identity element that satisfies this condition. So next up we have theorem 713 talking about the center. And it tells us that for all groups G, the center Z of G of the group G is a subgroup of G. So to prove this, we'll suppose G is an arbitrary group, and to show the center is a subgroup, we need to verify our three conditions, SG0, SG1, and SG2. So starting with SG0, non-empty, we need to show that the center, Z of G, is non-empty. And to show this, we can show that the identity element belongs to the center. And this follows since EG is equal to just G, which is equal to GE, for all elements G and G. So this tells us that the identity element commutes with all elements in G, which we knew, and therefore Z of G contains the identity element and is non-zero, so it satisfies SG0. Next we have SG1 closure for all elements AB in the center, A times B is in the center, to prove this, we'll suppose that A and B are arbitrary elements of the center, and we need to show that their product, AB, is in the center. To show this, we need to show for all G and G, AB times G is equal to G times AB. So we'll suppose that G and G is arbitrary, and then AB times G, this is A times BG, that's using G2, the associative law, and this is equal to A times GB. So what we're doing here is replacing BG with GB, and this follows since B belongs to the center, so it commutes with G. Next, we can rearrange parentheses, and this is equal to AG times B, that's by the associative law again, and then AG is equal to GA, and that's because A belongs to the center, so it commutes with every, ele every element in the group, and in particular with G. And rearranging parentheses one more time, this is equal to G times the quantity AB. So we've shown that AB is e times G is equal to GAB, and therefore AB belongs to the center, and the center satisfies SG1. Next we have SG2, containment of inverses, so for all A and Z of G, A inverse belongs to Z of G. 
So suppose a is an arbitrary element of z of g. We need to show a inverse belongs to z of g. And to show this, we need to show for all g and g, a inverse g is equal to g a inverse. So we'll suppose g and g is arbitrary. And we need to show a inverse g is equal to g a inverse. Well, since a belongs to the center, then we know that it commutes with g. So a g is equal to g a. And multiplying both sides of this equation on the left by a inverse, we obtain a inverse times the quantity a g is equal to a inverse times the quantity g a. And on the left and on the right, we can rearrange parentheses. So we obtain a inverse a times g is equal to a inverse g times a. So that's by the associative law. And on the left, a inverse times a is just the identity, and the identity times g is just g. So now we've got the equation g is equal to quantity a inverse g times a. And we're going to multiply both sides of this equation on the right now by a inverse. And we obtain g a inverse is equal to a inverse g a times a inverse. And on the right side, a times a inverse is just the identity element. And the identity element times a inverse g just gives us a inverse g. So we end up with g times a inverse is equal to a inverse g. This is the equality we needed to show and therefore a inverse belongs to the center and our center satisfies SG2. And this completes the proof that the center is a subgroup of G. Next we want to look at cyclic subgroups. Let G be a group and let A be an element of G. We denote the set of all powers of A, integer powers of A, by using this angle bracket notation. And this is the set of all powers a to the n as n ranges over all integers. So this is all powers positive, zero, and negative. And first we have a theorem that tells us that this is a subgroup. So let g be a group and let a be an element of g. Then the angle bracket a, which is the set of a to the n as n ranges over all integers, is a subgroup of g. And this is called the cyclic subgroup generated by the element a. To prove this, we need to verify sg0, sg1, and sg2. So starting with sg0, we need to show that this set, this angle bracket a set, is not empty. And since a belongs to the set, then we know that it is not empty. Next, sg1 closure for all b, c, in the set angle bracket a, b times c is in the set. So let's suppose that b, c are two arbitrary elements from our set. Then b is a power of a, an integer power of a, and c is also an integer power of a. So b is equal to a to the m, and c is equal to a to the n for some integers m and n. Then the product b, c is equal to a to the m times a to the n, which is just a to the m plus n, which belongs to our set angle bracket a, since m plus n is an integer. So this is an integer power of a, so by definition it belongs to our set. And therefore the set angle bracket a satisfies SG1. Now we have SG2, containment of inverses. We need to show for all b in the set angle bracket a, b inverse belongs to the set. So let's suppose that b is an arbitrary element of the set. Then b is equal to a to the m for some integer m. And then b inverse will be a to the m inverse, which is a to the minus m, which belongs to the set angle bracket a since minus m is an integer. And therefore the set angle bracket a satisfies SG2. And thus this is a subgroup. Now, in the case that the cyclic subgroup generated by A, this set, angle bracket A, is the entire group, we say that the group is cyclic. Now, a group G is a cyclic group, then, provided that G is equal to angle bracket A for some element A and G. 
For an example, we can find the cyclic subgroups of U7, which consist of the integers mod 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, once again, remember that U7 is the set of units in Z7. So these are the elements of Z7 that have a multiplicative inverse. And so this is a group under multiplication mod 7. And we can also ask if U7 is cyclic. So the cyclic subgroups, just starting one by one with each element, well, the cyclic subgroup generated by 1 is just going to be the set containing 1. The cyclic subgroup generated by 2, this will be 2, 2 squared, which is 4, and 2 cubed is 8, but mod 7, that's 1. And then if you start taking higher powers, they'll just start repeating. And so if we rewrite this as the set containing 1, 2, and 4, that will be the cyclic subgroup generated by 2. Next, we have the cyclic subgroup generated by 3. This will be 3, 3 squared, which is 9, which is 2 mod 7. 3 cubed is 27, which is 6 mod 7. 3 to the 4th, that will be 81. And mod 7, that will be 4. And 3 to the 5th, well, let's see, that will be uh, 3 times 3 to the 4th, so that will be 3 times 4, which is 12. Mod 7, that's equal to 5. And then 3 to the 6th, that will be 3 times 3 to the 5th, so that will be 3 times 15, 5, which is 15, which mod 7 is 1. And then if you start taking higher powers, you're just going to start repeating again. And so this will be the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then the cyclic subgroup generated by 4. This will be 4. 4 squared, which is 16. Mod 7 is 2. 4 cubed is 64. Mod 7, that will be 1. So this is the set containing 1, 2, and 4. And then the cyclic subgroup generated by 5. This will be 5. Uh, 5 squared is 25, which mod 7 is 4. 5 cubed, that will be 5 times 4 is 20, which is 6 mod 7. 5 to the 4th will be 5 times 6, that will be 30, which is equal to 2 mod 7. 5 to the 5th is 5 times 2 is 10, which is 3 mod 7. And 5 to the 6th, that will be 5 times 3, which is 15 which is equal to 1 mod 7. So this is the set containing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And finally, the cyclic subgroup generated by 6 is equal to 6, and then 6 squared is 36, which mod 7 is equal to 1. And so this is the set containing 1 and 6. Now, when I did these computations, I only looked at the positive powers, OK? And so uh, if you look at the negative powers, you're going to end up just repeating the same elements over again. OK, now examining our subgroups, we can see that 3 and 5 consist of the entire group. So the cyclic subgroup generated by 3 and the cyclic subgroup generated by 5 equal the entire group U7. And so that tells us that U7 is cyclic. Next, we have theorem 715. So if we let G be a group and let A be an element of G, two parts. First, if A has infinite order, then the cyclic subgroup generated by A is an infinite subgroup consisting of the distinct elements A to the K for all K in Z. And second, if A has finite order N, then the cyclic subgroup generated by A is a subgroup of order N and consists of a to the 0, which is the identity, a to the 1, a to the 2, up to a to the n minus 1. So if our element a has infinite order, then our cyclic subgroup is an infinite subgroup. If our element a has finite order n, then our cyclic subgroup is a subgroup of order n. Now, if you recall, the order of a group or of a subgroup 
is just the number of elements in the group or subgroup. And the order of an element is something very different. That's the smallest positive integer power of the element that equals the identity. And so those two definitions are defined independently of one another, and they don't seem to necessarily have any connection to one another. But you can see that this theorem tells you how they're connected. Okay, that basically the order of the element tells you the order of the cyclic subgroup generated by that element. Okay, to prove this, well, starting with 1, we'll suppose A has infinite order, and we need to show that the cyclic subgroup generated by A is an infinite subgroup consisting of the distinct elements A to the K for all K and Z. Since A has infinite order, then looking back at theorem 7.8 in section 7.2, this implies that the elements A to the K for each K and Z are distinct. And this implies that the cyclic subgroup, angle bracket A, which is the set A to the K as K ranges over all integers, is an infinite subgroup consisting of the elements A to the K for each K and Z. So this is exactly what 1 says. Next we have 2, so we'll suppose that A has finite order n, and we need to show that the cyclic subgroup generated by A is a subgroup of order n, and consists of a to the 0, which is e, a to the 1, a to the 2, up to a to the n minus 1. Now, by definition, the cyclic subgroup generated by a is a set of all integer powers of a. So it's a set a to the k as k ranges over all integers. By theorem 7.9 part 2, for any integers i and j, a to the i is equal to a to the j, if and only if i is congruent to j mod n. So I think one of the i's in that first equation is supposed to be a j. So let's suppose that a to the i is an arbitrary element of our cyclic subgroup. We need to show that a to the i belongs to the set containing the powers a to the 0, a to the 1, a to the 2, up to a to the n minus 1. Since i is congruent to one of 0, 1, 2, up through n minus 1, modulo n, those are all the possible remainders upon division by n, so every integer must be congruent to one of those. Then by theorem 7, 9, part 2, a to the i is going to be equal to 1 of a to the 0, a to the 1, a to the 2, up to a to the n minus 1. And therefore, a to the i belongs to that set and therefore the cyclic subgroup generated by A will be equal to that set. Now since no two of 0, 1, 2, up through n minus 1 are congruent modulo n, those are all the distinct remainders, then the theorem implies that these powers A to the 0, A to the 1, A to the 2, up to A to the n minus 1 are distinct. And therefore angle bracket A is a subgroup of order n. And this completes the proof of part two of the theorem, so completes the proof of the theorem. Now, when the group operation is addition, then we write ka, the multiple um, of a, in place of a to the k, a power of a. And then the cyclic subgroup generated by a is written as multiples of a. So we would have angle bracket a is equal to the set na, as n ranges over all integers. Theorem 715 can then be written in the following form. So this is the additive version of the theorem. Let G be a group and let A be an element of G. If A has infinite order, then angle bracket A is an infinite subgroup consisting of the distinct elements Ka for all K and Z. And two, if A has finite order N, then the subgroup generated by A is a subgroup of order N and consist of the identity element, which is 0, and then all the multiples of a, 1a, 2a, 3a, up to n minus 1a. For an example, the group z under addition is cyclic. So the group z equals the set n times 1 as n ranges over all integers. So it's all integer, integer multiples of 1. 
And so this will be the subgroup generated by 1. So z is cyclic with generator 1. Next we have theorem 717. Every subgroup of a cyclic group is cyclic. To prove this, let's suppose that G equal angle bracket A is an arbitrary cyclic group, and suppose H is an arbitrary subgroup of G. We need to show that H is cyclic. Now, in the case that H is the identity subgroup, then H just contains the identity element, then H will be the cyclic subgroup generated by the identity element, so H is cyclic. So let's suppose then that H is not the identity subgroup. Then H contains a non-identity element of G. Let's say A to the I for some integer I not equal to zero. So remember now G is cyclic, so all the elements of G are powers of A. Since H is a subgroup, then H contains inverses. So A to the I inverse, which will be A to the minus I, will belong to H. And so either I or minus I must be positive. So this tells us that H contains at least one positive power of A. And we'll let K be the smallest positive integer such that A to the K belongs to H. So K is the smallest positive integer power of A that belongs to H. And we know that K exists by the well-ordering axiom. If we, let, uh, if we consider the set of all positive integer powers of A that belong to H, the well-ordering axiom tells us that that set must have a smallest element. So we want to show that H is the cyclic subgroup generated by A to the K, where K is the smallest positive integer power of A that belongs to H. So we want to show that H is the set angle bracket A to the K. Now to prove this, we need to show that the set, the cyclic subgroup generated by A to the K is contained in H, and H is contained in that cyclic subgroup generated by A to the K. Now since A to the K belongs to H, then we know that all powers of A to the K will belong to H by closure. So that tells us that the cyclic subgroup generated by A to the K will be a subset of H. Now to prove the opposite inclusion, we'll suppose H is an arbitrary element of H, and we need to show that little h is an element of the cyclic subgroup generated by A to the K. And to show this, we need to show that little h is a power of A to the K. The cyclic subgroup consists of all the powers of A to the K, so to show that h belongs to that, we need to show that h is a power of K, A to the K. Now, since H belongs to G, which is, the, which is generated by A, that tells us that H is equal to A to the M for some integer M in Z. Okay. Now, by the division algorithm, dividing M by K, there exists integers Q and R such that M is equal to KQ plus R, and our remainder R is greater than or equal to zero and less than K. Then solving for the remainder r, r is equal to m minus kq. And let's look at a to the r power. This will be a to the m minus kq power, which is a to the m times a to the minus kq power, which is a to the m times a to the k to the minus q power. And since a to the k belongs to h, and a to the m is little h, which belongs to h, so that means that all powers of a to the k will also belong to h. So both of the factors on the right side in this equation belong to h, and therefore a to the r belongs to h. But a to the k was the smallest positive integer power of a that belonged to h. And r is greater than or equal to 0 and strictly less than k. So in order for a to the r to belong for a to the r to belong to h, it must be the case that r is zero. r can't be positive, so it must be zero. And that tells us that m is equal to kq, and h is equal to a to the m 
is a to the kq, which is equal to a to the k to the q, and this is going to belong to the subgroup generated by a to the k. That is a power of a to the k, so it belongs to that subgroup by definition. And therefore, capital H is a subset of the subgroup generated by a to the k, and therefore H is equal to that sub subgroup, so H is cyclic. And that completes the proof of the theorem. One final topic in this section is we want to look at generators of a group. Now, if G is a cyclic subgroup generated by an element A, we can think of G as being formed out of all possible products of A and A inverse. We can generalize this idea to groups being generated by more than one element. And so we have theorem 718. Let S be a non-empty subset of a group G, and we'll let angle bracket S be the set of all possible products in every order of elements of S and their inverses. And a product is allowed to have a single factor, so this set angle bracket S will include the elements of S. So then 1, well this is a subgroup of G that contains S, and secondly if H is a subgroup of G that contains S, then H contains the entire subgroup angle bracket S. Okay, so this theorem shows that the set angle bracket S is the smallest subgroup of G that contains the set S, and the set angle bracket S is called the subgroup generated by S. Now, if G is equal to angle bracket S, then we say that S generates G, and refer to the elements of S as the generators of G. Now note that when S contains a single element, so S is the set containing just the element A, then angle bracket S is just the cyclic subgroup angle bracket A. So let's take a look at the proof. So first we have angle bracket S is a subgroup of G that contains S. To prove this, we want to show that angle bracket S satisfies our three conditions, SG0, SG1, and SG2. So for SG0 non-empty, we need to show that our set angle bracket S is non-empty. And by definition, angle bracket S contains S. And since S is non-empty, then angle bracket S is non-empty, so satisfies SG0. Next, we have SG1 closure for all AB in angle bracket S. A times B is in angle bracket S. So if we suppose that A and B are arbitrary elements of angle bracket S, then both A and B are products of elements of S or inverses of elements of S. So each element of the set angle bracket S is a product of elements of S or inverses of elements of S. So if we A is going to be A1, A2 down to A sub R, and b will be b1, b2, down to b sub t, for some positive integers r and t, where each a i and b j is either an element of s or the inverse of an element of s. Then the product a b, this will be a1, a2, down to a r, times b1, b2, down to b sub t. This is also a product of elements of s or inverses of elements of s therefore belongs to angle bracket S, so angle bracket S satisfies SG1. Next we have SG2, containment of inverses for all A in angle bracket S. A inverse belongs to a angle bracket S. So let's suppose that A is an arbitrary element of angle bracket S. Then A is going to be A1, A2, down to A sub R for some positive integer r, where each a sub i is either an element of s or the inverse of an element of s. Then a inverse will be a1, a2, down to a sub r inverse. And this will be a sub r inverse, down to a sub 2 inverse, down to a sub 1 inverse. When we take the inverse of a product, we get the product of the inverses, but in reverse order. And this is also a product of elements of S or inverses of elements of S. And therefore, A inverse belongs to angle bracket S. 
so angle bracket S satisfies SG2. And thus, angle bracket S is a subgroup. So this proves part one of the theorem. Next we have part two. If H is a subgroup of G that contains S, then H contains the entire subgroup, angle bracket S. So to prove this, we'll suppose H is an arbitrary subgroup of G that contains S. We need to show that H contains angle bracket S. Now since H is a subgroup and contains S, then it must contain the inverse of each element in S. It must then contain all products of elements of S and inverses of elements of S by closure. And therefore H must contain angle bracket S. By definition, angle bracket S consists of products of elements of S and inverses of elements of S. And H contains each of those products. For an example of this, the group U15, so consists of 1, 2, 4, 7, 8, 11, 13, and 14. So these are the integers mod 15 that have multiplicative inverses. This group is generated by the set S containing 7 and 11. So to show this, we need to show that each element in U15 can be written as a product with 7 and 11 and their inverses. Well, first note that 7 times 13 is 91, which mod 15 is equal to 1. So this tells us that 7 inverse is equal to 13. Also, 11 times 11 is 121, which is equal to 1 mod 15. So that says that the inverse of 11 is itself 11. But this doesn't contribute any additional element, so that doesn't really add anything to our set. So we want to write each element in U15 as a product with the elements 7, 11, and 13. So we're using the elements 7, 11, and their inverses, which include 13. Well, we can start with 1. So 1 is equal to 7 times 13. So that's 91, which mod 15 is equal to 1. 2 well, 2 is equal to 7 times 11, that's 77, mod 15 is equal to 2. 4, well, this is 7 squared, that's 49, and uh, mod 15, that will be 4. And 7 is just itself. 8 is 11 times 13, so 11 times 13 is, uh, what, 143, and if you reduce that mod 15, that turns out to be 8. 11 is just itself. 13 is just itself. And finally, 14. Well, 14 is, uh, let's see, that's 2 times 7, and we have 2 written as 7 times 11, and 7 is just itself. So this will be 7 squared times 11. So therefore, U15 is the is generated by the set S. Every element in U15 can be written as a product uh, of the elements in the set S or their inverses. For another example, let's look at the dihedral group D4, the symmetries of the square. And we want to show that this is generated by the set containing R1 and H. To show this, we want to look at the operation table for D4. So that's shown there. And we need to show that each element in D4 now can be written as a product of uh, elements in our set or their inverses. Now R1 inverse is actually equal to R3, and H inverse is just itself. So first off, R0, this will be R1 to the fourth power. So R1 was a 90 degree rotation, so if we apply that four times, we'll get back to where we started from, and so we'll get the identity. And then that's also equal to H squared, so H is a reflection, and if we apply the reflection twice, we get back to where we started from. So we can write R0 either in either of those two forms. Next we have R1, which is just itself. 
R2, well, R2 is a 180 degree rotation, and that's going to be a 90 degree rotation followed by another 90 degree rotation, so that will be R1 squared. And R3, well, this is a 270 degree rotation, so that will be a 90 followed by a 90 followed by a 90. So that's R1 cubed or you can think of it as R1's inverse. Next we have D. Okay, and so we want to write D as a composition involving R1 and H. Well, let's take a look at the row containing H, or corresponding to H. And you'll notice that D appears in the column corresponding to R1 in that row. So this tells us that D is equal to H composed with R1. Next we have H. Well, H is just itself. Nothing to do there. And then T. Well, for T, let's look at the uh, row containing R1. So the row corresponding to R1. And if you'll notice in that row, in the H column, we get T. So T is equal to R1 composed with H. And then finally we have V. And for V, we'll look at the uh, row corresponding to H again. And V appears there in the column corresponding to R2. So V is equal to H composed with R2. And we know that R2 is R1 squared. So this is H composed with R1 squared. So now we've written each element in the group as a composition involving R1 and H. And thus D4 is generated by that set containing R1 and H. And this finishes up the section.